Good morning and welcome to Collaborative Statistics. Uh, today we'll be looking at chapter 10, uh, hypothesis testing with two means. Now um, what this means is that we will have two groups that we will be comparing, uh, group A and group B. We'll either be looking at the proportions or the means of these and comparing them and they're going to be either independent or matched pairs. Now independent means that we have two separate groups. So we have a control group and an experiment group. We have uh, males and females that we are comparing and seeing do these people agree or disagree? Are the weights the same or not? Uh, versus the match pairs where we have a single person doing uh, a test, doing some work, do either you know com something that will uh, affect that the outcome of the test and then taking the test again and then seeing are the differences in those uh, results. So when we look at the independent values we have two separate values, we have two separate means or two separate portions and we are asking are they equal to each other? You know, if we subtract them are they equal to zero? Okay, And you know, this has some effects on our standard deviations that we're going to have to use because we notice we have two things. We're not looking at just a single value anymore. We have separate ones. So if we know the population standard deviations for both um, for, for, for both pop populations, okay, we still use a z-score, but we have to change this. Okay, we no longer just have the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We have to square our standard deviations, divide by n, square our standard deviation, divide by n, and then add them up, then take the square root. We have to subtract off our sample means from each other and subtract off the port population means that we're looking to compare but we know that this is equal to zero because that's what we're testing it against so those kind of get eliminated all right everything else follows the same format we still test to figure out if this is a one or two tail test we still figure out what statistic we're using we still figure out what is the distribution we still compare our p to alpha or our um, P to alpha over 2 if we have a two-tailed test. We still look to see is it less than or greater than. We still reject or do not reject. We still write up our, our responses in, in, in a sentence. So those things from chapter 9 stay the same. The big difference is that we are dealing with this different you know denominator here, this different you know uh, standard error of the standard deviation you know because we have two standard deviations that we're comparing. If we do not know the population standard deviation, we still use a t-test. Okay, we still use the t-distribution. So that part hasn't st hasn't changed. The part that has changed is that we can't calculate the we can't just write down what the degrees of freedom are because there's a formula that goes into it and has lots of uh, parts to it. So we just kind of ignore it and we let the calculator give it to us at the end. And we might have a decimal. You know, so we can have, you know, 13.64 as our degrees of freedom. You know, so it's no longer a nice clean number. Okay, it's not two anymore. There's going to be decimals in this, um, but everything else is the same. We still subtract off our means. We still divide by our standard deviations squared over the n. With standard deviation squared over n, add them up, take the square root. So this part is similar to the part from the z t the one that we just looked at and you know but notice it's still different from the regular one but we still have to uh, go through our list okay we still have to follow that whole list it's going to tell you exactly what you have to do but the big differences are degrees of freedom have changed and the standard error down here at the bottom is different when we do proportions Again, our standard error is different. We have to have this pooled proportion, which means that we add up our successes, divide by the total number of events for each piece. Okay, we figure out that proportion, subtract it from one, so we find the complement of that proportion, and then multiply by one over n of the first one plus one over n of the second one. We have to add those together first. Okay then we multiply them, then we take the square root. So that part that goes into the denominator. We still use a z-test. 
we still subtract off our um, sample proportions here. We have to calculate our sample proportions. We have our population proportions, but again, these are going to be zero, so we can we'll put a zero there. Uh, if we have a two sided test, remember we compare our p value to alpha over two, or our double our p value to alpha, which um, Elowski likes in, in this book. Um, but other books will have you comparing a p value to alpha over two. So we still we still do those pieces. Those parts haven't changed. The big parts that have changed are what goes into the denominator, basically, on all three uh, types. Now, with matched pairs, as I said, it's a single person doing something coming, taking a, a, so they, lifting weights. Then maybe they go through some strength training, and then they come back and lift weights again and see how many time, how many reps they can do. And we look to see, has that changed at all? If it's changed, then, you know, doing this is probably a good thing. Um, so we are always going to be comparing these differences. We take our two, our two lists, subtract from, subtract them, and we look to see, is the mean zero? Okay, we do a t distribution, still with n minus one degrees of freedom. We have our standard deviation of our sample. We have our square root of n. We put those pieces together, and that is what we're going to do to, for the t statistic to calculate that. Okay, and we're going to then compare that, find our p values, compare it to alpha, and make our decisions about whether or not these things are effective or not. Okay, so I will see you in class on Saturday.